Hey gang, Professor McElroy here, Graphic Design One, Class Week Three. Uh, remember that this session is five weeks because next week is spring break and we don't have anything. Uh, next week is spring break. So I know Monday is closed on campus here. Uh, I'm not sure about Tuesday through Friday. I think campus may be open. We just have no classes running. Uh, tonight, we're going to be tackling uh, Adobe InDesign, which is a multi-page program. So think of uh, books, think of magazines, think of newsletters, uh, newspapers, anything that's multi-page that is very text heavy is what InDesign is. I call it a container program because it's a container that holds pictures and a container that holds text. And how those two things interact is how the world kind of evolves and revolves in InDesign class. The thing with InDesign is it's a great program to import Illustrator files, import Photoshop files, and collage everything you created in one location. Many designers use InDesign to make a finish composition from pieces they may have created somewhere else. So think of like a magazine cover. The magazine cover has the photo shoot photo, whoever the feature article is on. So let's just say it's, um, I don't know, it's a National Geographic and it's a story about uh, Africa. And there's a really beautiful pictures of uh, lions and tigers and giraffes. That picture might be a Photoshop file that has a couple of different pictures kind of blended together. Well, a designer would bring that Photoshop file into InDesign and then add the text on top of it, like the name National Geographic, or maybe the text that appears that highlights the other articles in the magazine. InDesign is a container program. It's where you add pictures and text together in a multi-page environment. I don't wanna say it's less creative because that's not true, but it really is a program used to compile things that you would think of that are multiple page, uh, a novel, a textbook, a magazine layout, a newsletter, a flyer you get uh, when you go to the store, um, maybe, the, uh, maybe a pamphlet that you get in church or if you go to the YMCA or you go to a gym and they have little brochures, uh, the trifold brochures that are folded and put into the little uh, brochure holder at the entrance of like the Miramar outlets and all that. Anything, a menu, anything that has multiple sides that includes text and pictures. Multiple sides includes text and pictures. So really, honestly, the creativity is the elements you bring in from other locations that you're compiling in InDesign. It is the best way to flow lots of text and pictures together in a one location. So if you ever used Microsoft Publisher before, for that matter, Word, even though Word is a very simplified version of a desktop publishing program, really Publisher is more like InDesign. Uh, if you're a little bit older, maybe use PageMaker at some point in time. Uh, I used Quark Express, which used to be a product that doesn't even exist anymore. Adobe InDesign has become that thing. The Naples Daily News, they use Adobe InDesign. Uh, Gulf Shore Life, the magazine that they sell at Barnes & Noble, they use InDesign. Anything that's multiple pages that has images and text. The projects in the chapter for this particular book is editing a coupon, making a two-sided postcard that already has a picture for the background and you're putting things like the information on the postcard for the mailing address, and things like that, text and pictures. The reason you use InDesign or any multi-page environment is because you want consistency of typography, ease of editing copy, and the ability to flow text across multiple pages. And if you make an edit on just one page, it reflows the text across all the other pages so that you don't have to reformat text on another page if you make a change on page one, two, three, four. Uh, I helped my son's high school a few months ago, put together an athletic brochure uh, program of sorts for their sports for the spring. It was 36 pages. I created a little cover for them. I flowed all the text for all the events they run in the spring at the high school. And then I gave them a finished PDF 
of the text and images for them to take to the print shop that they have in the high school to print out the brochures. So if you go to a Broadway show, anything that has multiple pages, I don't wanna say it's less creative to use in design, but if you're doing like fancy things with pictures, image collages and things like that, you have to do it in Photoshop and import the Photoshop file into InDesign. You're not gonna do the fancy image blends in InDesign. In, InDesign gives you a big blue box with an X. The big blue box with the X is what's telling you it's a container holding an image. So it's a link. So if you took web design with me and I talked about file management where you need one folder that your website project has all the stuff inside of, InDesign's exactly the same. You can't have stuff all over the place. You need one folder called chapter one or one folder called chapter two. And inside that folder, there should be an INDD file, an InDesign file, and any of the images that are part of the design that you're using because InDesign makes a big X and it points to the picture. Now, if you had files all over your computer and you had one InDesign file, InDesign will actually allow you to do which is called flight or package your document. And it will actually export your InDesign file and all of the images that are all over the place on your computer into one folder. So it'll actually clean it up for you, but don't lean on that because you should by practice be thinking, I need a folder with pictures in it. And I need a folder with maybe a text file or a Word document that has a bunch of text that you wanna use and the InDesign file. Those are the things you need. If you give me just the InDesign file as your chapter one submission, I can't see anything because all the little blue X's will be empty because they're linked, not embedded. And if they're linked to a file on your computer, I'm obviously not sitting on your computer. I won't see the picture, but I will show you a really easy way tonight to export a PDF file. And if we've learned anything the first couple of weeks about a PDF file, it puts everything together for you and basically makes an image of it. So if you ever kind of are worried about an Illustrator file or a Photoshop file or an InDesign file, any file you're using, a Word, Maybe you created something in Word and you created something for your church. Maybe it's a handout or something. It has some pictures in it and has some text. And you're worried about whether they can print it there to give out to whatever meeting or group or whatever you're doing. Save it as a PDF. The default is always save it as a PDF because what a PDF does is it freezes the image just the way it looks on your computer and makes it so someone who doesn't have all the stuff on your computer can open it. And that's important with software too. Maybe you have InDesign, but the person printing the little flyer you made doesn't have InDesign. If you save it as a PDF, they can open it on their computer. They can print it. Actually, if you save Illustrator as a PDF, the person on the under, other end can actually right click it and break it apart and get all the pieces that are inside the PDF because it's a vector file and those vector objects are saved in the frozen image of the PDF. So PDFs are really beautiful. When in doubt, print your screen with the file opened up on it with everything laid out the way that it's supposed to be laid out. And that screenshot image at 3000 pixels is a good frozen image if you're sharing something with someone else. So that's the really the very last default, but it is a possible default. Uh, I have so many people asking me to clean up files of theirs and they never had the source file and they're only able to give me like a web address with pages on it or a PDF or something. So I do spend my life right clicking a lot, trying to break things apart in order to be able to use them because everyone has a different computer, has different formats, has different stuff. And sometimes all they have is some kind of frozen image that they need me to recreate. So just kind of be aware of that. So we're going to do a little... Uh, what I would call like a little brochure, a little 11 by 17 folded document that's basically made up of four, eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper, because it's the very standard flyer format that you would use if you were making a four page anything for anyone. So it's a pretty standard format. I know the first couple of chapters in your InDesign are postcards, which are just two little two, two pages uh, little four by six postcards. So, but I want to show you what a folding document looks like in InDesign because 
everything that's produced that's multiple pages traditionally is printed on a piece of paper and folded. So if you go to a, a, a Broadway show, off-Broadway show, you go to an event at uh, Hertz Arena and it's a hockey event and they give you a program. If you go to a concert and they hand you anything, everything is printed in a facing, what we call facing pages environment. And I don't know if you noticed in the announcement section, but Baskin Robbins did a rebrand after 77 years. Uh, I have two teenage boys. They eat me out of house and home and they like ice cream. So we go to like every ice cream place there can possibly be around the place. But I was pretty, thought it was pretty cool after so many years that Baskin Robbins is doing a redesign. So I thought we would take some pictures and text from Baskin Robbins and lay out a little story of Baskin Robbins little program uh, using InDesign. So we can look at containers, we can look at flowing text, we can look at the basic layout of InDesign. So let's click here and let's download our little zip file here. And this will have some pictures and a logo and some just basic Baskin Robbins stuff. We're gonna actually grab the text off of the website and I'll kind of show you what happens when you copy text out of an XML environment, which is what a website is versus copying something out of a, like a notepad, like a digital notepad or Word or something that maybe is less formatted than say a website is. So we're gonna take a look at a couple of different things here, but we're gonna do a basic multi-page collage using InDesign so you can see what the environment looks like. I'm sure you've used some kind of multi-page document program in the past, even if it was just writing a, a, a paper for a class here at Hodges. I think everyone, the basic computer class teaches basic PowerPoint and Word and everything. So you've interacted in a multi-page environment. Hopefully when you see InDesign, you're gonna think, man, everything I write from now on, I'm gonna do an InDesign because it's a much better program when I have to write a seven page paper than Word that doesn't flow text quite as well as InDesign does. InDesign does a really good job of it. So maybe this ends up being a program that you might end up using in any career field, any job, any anything you end up in, because this is a program that is very flexible. If you're working now and you're not working in design, I'm gonna guess the company you work for has a newsletter or has printed documentation or has something that they share with the employee, employees every month or every quarter or maybe once a year, uh, they build it in InDesign. They either have an agency that does it or they have an internal marketing department. So you never know when you might wanna put a little newsletter together for your department or maybe you're having a party for someone who's leaving the company and you wanna put a little flyer together. InDesign is a really great program for text and pictures and collaging it all in one place. It's got two kinds of containers an image container and a text container. And that's pretty much it. It's whatever you can dream up in a container environment that you can create a, create a layout from. So, and think about InDesign as for print, even though nowadays with Kindles and iPads, and I've been trying to get myself into buying the Apple News at whatever dollar a month it is because they have all the magazines, all the magazines that I go to Barnes and Noble and I sit and read at the bench by the Starbucks, you can now do interactively using Apple News and some of the online app platforms. Well, all of those magazines were created in InDesign and then they were exported as an interactive PDF. So you either see EPUB or PDF. Either one of those, they were both exported out of InDesign as a printable document. They just exported it as an interactive thing that you use your finger to turn pages on. As you get a little bit further in the InDesign book, which we don't do in Graphic Design 1, you start adding little menus that when you touch your finger on it, it expands the menu out in the document and you can jump from one page to the next. So think about it like an interactive textbook. You click the little menu, it expands out, you click the different chapters and it jumps you right to the chapters. We call that anchoring in a document. InDesign does that. And now when designers design for books and magazines and newsletters, they actually add the interactivity into the InDesign file, even though it's being printed. So if it, also, if it has to be printed and created in, in an interactive environment for touchscreen or for downloading online, they can do it all from one file. 
So InDesign's a beautiful thing. It's very simple in nature, but it can be very complicated if you know a little bit of interactive design like web design, because all that code that we wrote for kind of web design one, basic JavaScript and HTML, that's actually all embedded in InDesign. So when you add an interactive button, it's adding all the code that we use to make the interactive button in Dreamweaver. It's just making it an InDesign. So, and I've actually seen people create web pages using InDesign with the interactive buttons and then exported it as a web design and HTML, because you can do that in InDesign. And they made their entire brochure style website using InDesign. And I've also had designers do every design they've ever done for me, pictures or not an illustrator. So just know that although software applications are made for specific applications, some designers, some creative thinkers, some visual communicators really like one program and they do a whole lot of stuff, if not all the stuff in one program. I mean, I've legitimately had designers work for me that created brochures that were seven pages, eight pages, 10 pages, all in Illustrator. They laid the text out one text box at a time, making sure there was no typos and did everything one artboard at a time, even though InDesign is a much better program. But remember, the final product is a PDF. So as long as it looks good and can be printed the way the client needs it to be printed, there are many ways to do it. So don't get too nervous, too much of a hiccup in any one thing, because there's lots of little mini tools I'm trying to show you in different programs. And kind of as you kind of piggyback one class to the next, you may actually gravitate towards one thing over the next. I have some people that come in and say, I'm going to do ads and logos and blah, blah, blah. And they end up going to work for, uh, there's a house of woo, I think the name of it is in Fort Myers, which does wedding stuff, brochures and catalogs and websites and all this stuff. I've had students come and they thought they were going to be logo and ad designers. And they end up taking the job at the house of woo and they do catalog design because they liked InDesign after they saw the simplicity of it, the simplicity of it. Others come in and they're like, I'm gonna be a CAD designer, a magazine designer, I'm gonna lay things out multi-page. And they start playing around with Illustrator and they really like vector graphics. And they practice the pen tool and they start to like to draw and they realize you can trace photos and still make vector graphics. And they start doing that stuff. So just know, Graphic Design One, we're spoon feeding you a little bit of skills from all the different programs to kind of see how your brain works. So that if you go to Graphic Design Two, you might start picking up skills and things that you liked more than other things. There's lots of ways to skin a cat. I'm trying to teach you the best applications and the process and show you what the finished product should look like, but there's lots of ways to get from A to Z. Some ways are better than others, but it doesn't mean there aren't the only ways to do it. I was actually talking to a student the other day and they love Procreate and they draw everything in it. And I'm okay with that. If I need you to create a logo illustration for me, you can draw it in Procreate if you want using your Apple Pencil. If you like Infinity Designer or Microsoft Publisher for multi-page, if you can do the things that the client needs, there's lots of ways to do it. And if you go work for a company as a marketing manager, they might already use a specific software for something. Hopefully the training shows you what the term is you're looking for, what the basic tool and process is, because it's all really similar. They just sometimes use a different software to do text flowing or image wrapping or text wrapping. It's all the same stuff. Sometimes they just use their own software to do it. So just know we're trying to learn kind of terms and tools and processes, but because a lot of the software does it the same way, but lots of people use different software. Okay, so now that we have the file download, I'm just gonna uh, minimize my browser and I'm gonna go to this little program called Adobe InDesign, which has the little ID right there, right? And it kicks up kind of this cool little image. I want to be the designer that just makes the little uh, uh, makes the little icons that appear when you open up a program. Like every time there's an update to the software, they change that little load image. I want to be the designer that creates the load image because those are always kind of cool. Okay, so when you open up InDesign, you're going to notice every program kind of has its own thing, right? When you open up Illustrator, it shows print and web and shows you different kind of standard formats 
that you might want your art boards to be in Illustrator. You open up Photoshop and immediately ask for resolution and size because you're using a color mode because you're using pictures as your primary design tool. When you open up a new program in Adobe, and there's lots of them, 20 some programs, they all kind of have their own little niche of different things they do. And they're all starting to overlap. So programs are starting to feel a lot the same, which I don't know why they're doing that. Why they added so much interactivity in InDesign when they have programs for interactivity like Adobe XD, Adobe Dreamweaver. There's already programs that have that stuff it gets kind of scary sometimes when they start adding too many elements to one program because then they're starting to void out the other programs because you can use one program. You can use Adobe XD and cre create wireframes and website designs and the whole nine yards. I don't know why InDesign has chosen to add so much interactivity. I know why they have because publishing companies only buy one software application. We want InDesign, we're just going to use InDesign. So we don't need Photoshop and Illustrator and all that other stuff. We're going to take the pictures, we're going to put them in InDesign, and we're going to put text over the top of them. They don't need the other stuff, but they also need to be able to make an interactive document. So that's why they start to add other skills to one software so that it gives companies the ability only to buy one software. I don't know why you wouldn't have the entire Adobe CC, but lots of companies just purchase one software application and they use it for everything. So. Okay, so we're in InDesign and we're just gonna open up a new document. So, right, we're in InDesign, we're just gonna do create new. And when you do create new, you're gonna see the same menus that you see up at the top of Illustrator when you open a new document. It's kind of trying to figure out print, web, mobile. It's trying to figure out what the document format is going to be. Uh, so let's go to the little print tab because you're gonna notice when I click on the print tab at the top of new document, that just like Word, InDesign has templates already. And I'm actually gonna show you how to place images, edit text, replace images. Do These templates can be really great if you need to create a little multi-page something and you're not overly creative in the design elements, the templates already have all the pieces there. You just replace the pictures and replace the text and all the fancy colors and all the extra design elements that are in there are already part of the InDesign template. So InDesign is really, really good for the small company, the nonprofit, maybe the organization, the LLC or the small company that doesn't have lots of design resources. I try to give things to nonprofits that they can edit easily. And InDesign is a great program for that. If I lay out the simple brochure for them, they can click on a picture and replace the image each time they need to make a new thing and keep the template exactly the same. So just like PowerPoint, Word, they all have templates. InDesign's no different. And there's templates on the web you can actually download also that gives you all the same elements. So you can actually see all the fancy design elements in these little brochures that you don't even have to recreate. It's title goes here, you tap on the text, you replace the title. Okay, so we're gonna do a letter piece of paper, right? Standard old eight and a half by 11, which you're gonna notice right over here gives us property presets. Now, Pike is the measurement in print world. And we actually have Pika rulers to measure. Let's switch to inches because everybody else in the world use inches <laughs> and a quarter of an inch, an eighth of an inch, eight and a half by 11. These are easier measurements for most people. Now, you're going to notice portrait and landscape, just like Illustrator, Photoshop, when you create something new. Now, we're going to create a simple 11 and a half piece, 11 and a half size piece of paper folded in half. And it would be what we called saddle stitched if we were making a document that has staples to hold it together. But this is a standard format for most things you get out in the world when you go and they hand you something. So in order to do that, we need to make this four pages. So we're gonna make it eight and a half by 11 inches, portrait, four pages, what we call spreads or facing pages needs to be checked. We're gonna start at page number one. Now, columns, when you open up a novel, if you're reading a book and you see that the text is columnated like a newspaper would be, those are the columns that have gutters in between the columns that separates the text so you can read it in its strips that it makes. Most published documents 
have two or three columns in each one of their pages because it's the easiest way to break up copy and kind of flow text from page to page. So we're gonna change ours to two, just because two is an easy number for splitting the page in half. It starts to give your brain an idea of what the page looks like if the eight and a half by 11 is split in half, 4.25 and 4.25 in the kind of scheme of things. I traditionally do two or three columns inside of my layout when I create my multiple page document. So you'll notice that the one eighth gutter is immediately added to my two columns. That just means that's the standard space between the two columns that are running in the book. And there's traditionally about a quarter to a half an inch around the margin. So you'll notice that if we click that down, this is a half an inch. Think of it like when you print a piece of paper on your printer at home and it has a white frame around it. Right, the color goes all the way to the edge, but your printer at home, your HP, your Epson, whatever you had, can't print to the edge, which we call bleed, right? Uh, so a little frame appears. That little border, that margin around it is exactly that is called a margin. Traditionally, you have at least a 0.5 and, and oftentimes the bottom margin will be 0.75 and everything else will be either 0.5 or 0.25. It's kind of like when you frame a picture, the frame on the left, the top, and the right is less than the bottom when they frame a picture because the extra width of the mat on the picture on the bottom lifts your eye up so that it doesn't feel like it's falling off the page. So traditionally, the bottom tends to be a little bit bigger. We're going to leave it standard 0.5 all the way around just so that you can see the cleanliness of the frame. We're not doing any kind of bleeds or anything in our document. If we were adding picture that goes to the edge, or we were adding something that went off of the page, then we would be adding some bleeds to our document for spacing purposes. Uh, we're gonna leave, we're gonna leave that as zeros because we're just going to do a standard newsletter, in essence, a standard folded program, newsletter, whatever you want to call it. So you should have eight and a half by eleven portrait, four pages facing pages starting at one with two columns and the standard margins already set up. And we're gonna go ahead and create that. Now, all of this should look semi similar to the other programs that we use so far in Photoshop and Illustrator. There's some things that should seem very consistent, which means we have a document Right, the document is traditionally white, whether we call it an artboard, a document, a page, doesn't really matter. It's all the same thing, canvas, and a pasteboard, which is this gray area over here. Remember, Illustrator has a pasteboard. You can move stuff over there, but the only thing you can see is what's on the document. InDesign is no different. The only thing you can see is on the document. You have a pasteboard, stuff you can put over here, but it has nothing to do with the final output. So if I put something over in this gray area on page number one, and I save a PDF to give to a client, if I have text over here that I wanted to be in the document, no one can see it but you. And especially if you make a PDF or a JPEG or a PNG out of your design, it cuts it off at the edge right here. So yes, this is just like Illustrator. There is what's called a pasteboard over here. But what you want the world to see has to exist on the document, the page, the artboard, whatever you want to call it. And also take a look that this has a half inch margin around the edges, it, which is framed in by this outer box. It has two columns, one left and one right, and the gutter in the middle, which was one eighth of an inch, which is running right through the middle here. It's built perfectly built right now for pictures and text to go in one of these columns or both of the columns. That's why columns are set up. Think about the olden days and the minuscules and the majuscules and the little letters that were on wooden blocks, which became metal blocks, and they had to put them in trays in order to print newspapers or maybe a poster announcing an event in the town. They needed they need it separated, right? Kind of like a typewriter. When you type it and you hit enter and it goes to the second line, you type it again. All it is is creating 
this space for things to align to. That's all InDesign is doing. The left-hand side is our toolbar. You'll notice some basic drawing tools, straight lines, pencils, pen tool, a shape tool, gradient tool, gradient feather tool, some basic tools. We know gradient from Illustrator, making one color change fade into another color. We know the feather tool from Photoshop, which allowed us to kind of blend images on the edge of something, kind of erase part of the picture like we did in our lecture week one. That wasn't a tool that didn't exist for a long time until they started making magazines interactive and they started giving you some Illustrator and some Photoshop tools, shape tools, pencils, line segment, text tool. Know that text is best produced in InDesign and Illustrator. Remember, little squares of color make up Photoshop. Remember when we zoomed in really close and looked at the way shapes looked in Photoshop and they had that thing called stepping where the little shapes change colors? Well, that's what text looks like in Photoshop. Little squares of color that change color as they go to the edges. Remember Illustrator when we zoomed in and it was a really solid fill and a really solid stroke? When you zoom into InDesign, text is a solid vector shape, which means it prints beautifully at any size. If you're doing text and you have lots of text, don't use Photoshop as your final program. So if you ever have a poster project and you have to write a paragraph on the poster and you want to have photos all blended together, but it's got a lot of text on it, you can bring your photos into InDesign and put the text on top of it. And I'm going to show you how to do that tonight. Anything that has needs to have crystal clear words at six point and 72 point. Really, really small, like a copyright, and really, really big, like the name of a magazine. Illustrator and InDesign do type beautifully at any size. Photoshop does not. So if it is text heavy or it's multi-page, InDesign is your friend. If it's multi-page, InDesign is your friend. If you need to create an illustration, you can create it in Illustrator, save it as an Illustrator file, and place it in InDesign as an object. InDesign is what I call a container program. It collects stuff from everywhere and compiles it in here by stacking it like little pieces of paper. One piece of paper, then a piece of paper on top of it, and then another piece of paper on top of it, and then another piece of paper on top of it. It just layers objects like Photoshop layers images when you bring different images into Photoshop. Remember, we did layer from background, and that was our piece of paper, and then we imported in other images in our beach photo, one layer or one image on top of each other, and it made a layer. That's all InDesign does. The only difference is it looks more like Illustrator where it's bring object to front, send object to back. And the layers aren't as recognizable in separation as Photoshop is. So what makes Photoshop so hard to use makes InDesign easier to use because you can select any layer and move it around and scale it and send it to back and bring it to front. You don't have to worry about selecting an area in a layer and hitting delete or changing the color of it and it be the wrong layer like in Photoshop. That's what's so hard about Photoshop. It's layer based. So you have to be selecting the pixels on the layer you're using. Illustrator and InDesign lets you compile everything like your dinner tonight on a plate or you put your chicken and your pasta and your cheesy broccoli and it's all on the plate and you can use your fork and eat any part of whatever's on your plate without having to make sure you're on the right layer. Illustrator and InDesign lets you literally select and manipulate anything on the page. It is much easier in that way. Okay, so we're in this document we created, which is four pages. The first thing we notice is the toolbar on the left and the palette on the right. Now, depending on how you opened up your document and what the defaults were already from the last person, that opened up InDesign. You should have some palettes over here. Two really important ones is properties and pages. If those aren't open, you can always go to the window dropdown and open up those palettes. 
That's really good to know, right? Just like Illustrator and Photoshop. If we didn't see a palette that the textbook said, open up the character palette, we need to go to the Windows drop down and make sure that that is open. You'll also notice under workspace, there's what's called essentials. That means the thousands of designers that helped code this program and continue to update it each month, each week, each year. These are the things they think people use the most. That's why they call it essentials. If you're ever in any of the Adobe programs and you just wanna go back to the basics, you can always go to workspace essentials or reset essentials and it'll give you the same old stuff that you see that they think every designer person using the program would like to have access to. Also remember, right click is your friend in all Adobe programs. That team of a thousand designers used to create and maintain this program is constantly updating the right click menu in all of the programs based on whatever the designers are using it for currently. So if you right click on a document or right click on any object inside of your document, you're gonna get the standard default effects, actions, processes that they think you would want to do with that object based on what the object is. So right clicking is your friend in any program. Using the window drop down menu to locate palettes is your friend. So if you ever see a video of a how to or you use or you use a step by step book or uh, somebody created some cool effect and you were reading the article and it had screenshots of what they were doing their palettes are no different than yours. All they did was customize their workspace based on the palettes they use. So designers that work for Oprah Magazine, they already have a uh, workspace set up based on all of the palettes they traditionally use over on the right-hand side. And they do what's called a new workspace and they make their own palettes on the right-hand side and they save it. So every time they open up InDesign, it has the same palettes they use every single time. They also use the same processes every single time. So once they set up one layout, all they do is replace the images in the text. So everyone thinks, oh my gosh, that's so much work. And it is, because you have to write the articles, get the pictures and all that. But Oprah has a certain look. Magnolia Magazine or whatever the one is that the design people on HGTV use, they have a magazine. I think it's Magnolia. I've looked through it one time, but everything they recommend that you should buy is always like, wicked expensive. Like, oh, I use this canvas bag all the time and I love it. And you look at it, it's like a thousand dollar canvas bag. It's like, oh my gosh, who uses a thousand dollar canvas bag? But that magazine has the same look every single month. It literally has a template of 64 pages because we call it a four up, which means it's four pages on one side of the piece of paper and four pages on the other side of the piece of paper and they fold it twice and staple it. So that's why everything's in sequences of eight eight pages is because they use what's called a four up process. So as you see, we created four pages here. If we wanted to add to it, ideally we want eight. And then after eight, we want either 12 or 16. You wanna make sure you're in what's called a four up environment. And I always give a client that gives me like, oh, I have 13 pages. I was like, well, you're either gonna have 12 <laughs> or we're gonna put a couple of empty pages in there to make sure that it makes it to the four up. That's why when you open up a book to read, there are blank pages. The reason there are blank pages are one, it's easier to print in a four up environment. So it's got to be in a sequence of eight pages, four pages on the front side of the piece of paper, four pages on the back side of the piece of paper, folded twice, creased, stapled, or glued to make. And the other is it does break up the chapters a little bit. So when you see chapter one to chapter two and the back side of the last page of chapter one is blank, and the first page of chapter two has chapter two written on it, there's actually a blank page in the InDesign file at that page number that tells the printer when you print this four on one side, four on the other and fold it and glue it, that that page is gonna be empty, which can be a bit tricky when someone says, I want the ad on the inside of the front cover to be my ad. And you're like, mm, page one is the front cover, page 32 is the back cover, page two is the inside front cover, and page 31 is the inside back cover. Eight pages, four and four. So, and you're gonna see it right here in the pages layout as I explain it. So, okay, toolbar left, 
palette's right. Pages palette, properties palette, really important. We're gonna do text wrapping and some basic filling of objects. So we're gonna make sure we have those open from our window palette too as we go. But when I reference it, I will also reference it in the window dropdown. Okay. Sorry, it's normally like 58 degrees in the lab. So I have a cup of coffee here. I've combated from last week that I was gonna stay warmer this week. So unless they want me to start a fire, I need to drink coffee every once in a while in the front here to stay, stay warm. Uh, actually today it was warmer in here. So I think they did something with the thermostat from last week, but okay. All right, so here we are. So we're in here, we have a blank document. We're on page number one, toolbar left, palettes right. Make sure that your pages palette is clicked so that we can see the four pages. Because I want to explain something here. Two really important factors in InDesign, just like PowerPoint, just like Word, just like Publisher. In PowerPoint, there is a master slide, right? In Word, there is a master page, which traditionally has a header and a footer that is on every page in your document. InDesign is no different. It has what's called an A master. So you'll actually notice up here, and I'm actually just gonna pinch this down a little bit, that there is a master page that is a left master and a right master. And you're gonna notice down in our document, we have page number one on the right side of what's called the fold, page number two and three, which is called the interior spread, like when you open a magazine and an article goes from the left to the right side of the page and it takes up that whole thing. Uh, I like to read men's journal uh, and men's fitness. And those are normally about actual, act, like healthy lifestyle, outside activity type stuff. And it'll be like some celebrity, I don't know, Denzel Washington. He's, how old is Denzel Washington? I don't know, probably in his sixties, right? And it'll be like, he's in the greatest shape of his life. And it'll be a picture of Denzel Washington, like uh, doing a kettlebell lift or something. And it'll have his name and it goes across both pages. And I have a picture of him on the left page and on the right page, will be the little lead in text to the article. He's in the greatest shape of his life since his days of blah, 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 and yada, yada, yada. And these are all the exercises he does, right? That's what this is. So think of page one is the cover page. Page four is the back page, and page two and three is the interior spread. Anytime you go to any event that hands you something, that the piece of paper is folded. So it could be eight and a half by 11 in landscape, and it's folded, and it has a front cover, a back cover, and when you open it up, an interior spread, right? You go to church, Saturday, Sunday, whenever you go, they hand you a little pamphlet that tells you the sequence of what's going to take place. Uh, in the service, and it has a front page that'll be like Easter Sunday, the back page will give credit to whoever or whatever events are happening at the church for the weekend. And when you open it up, it'll give you the sequence of the service, right? We're going to do play music here. We're going to uh, read this psalm, whatever it is. And it's a folded piece of paper. That's exactly what this is. Well, page one is the left side of the piece of paper. Page four, in essence, is the right side of the top of the piece of paper. And when you flip the piece of paper over, page two is the left side of that piece of paper, and page three is the right side. So imagine this four is pulled right up here and sitting next to page number one, because in essence, it is. That's what we call a four up. This little page is over here. That's why the master has a left master and a right master. If I want something to just appear on odd pages, page one, page three, page five, page seven, I would want to put it on the right master. If I wanted something to appear only on page two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, I would put it on what's called the left master. The master is only for elements that appear on every single page. So think about a book that you're reading. I don't read a lot of books that aren't textbooks, but I try to always have a book. Right now I'm reading a book about Lincoln and the 13 days it took him to get from Springfield to Washington DC for his inauguration and the amount of attempts there were to kill him on his way from his town to the White House for inauguration. Kind of an interesting book. But when you open up the book, the book has a page number. It has a chapter name. It has the actual book name itself. And I'm trying to think of it as the author. 
But those things, the header and the footer of those pages has elements that appear on every single page. If you open up a magazine, there's always a page number. There's always the article you're in for that particular part of the magazine. And normally at minimum, the name of the magazine. Why do they do that? If you tear the pages out of the magazine or out of the book, you still know where it came from. So masters are only for elements that appear on every page. And I say that and someone will put a photo on the master and ask why the photo appears on page one and three in their document. And they can't delete it from three because they only want it on page one. If, it, if you put it on the master, it appears on every single page based on the left master and the right master. So if we were making a little article about the history of Baskin Robbins, we would wanna put the name Baskin Robbins and or the logo, the page number at very minimal, and maybe the title of the article, those elements should appear on the master. All the pictures, the text, the, found, the photo of the founding guy, the, I think it was a guy, um, all the flavors of the month, all the article text about it, those have to appear on the individual pages. So if you open up a file in your textbook and it has you editing a file, it has to be in one of two places, on the master or on one of these pages that you're editing. And if it is an element, and I don't know, I don't think we get to that advanced in InDesign, but we do a newsletter, the elements that appear on every single page in the newsletter are in the master area, not in the actual document pages area. So you'll notice page one is all by itself. If we double click on page two, you'll actually see that page two and three are touching each other. That's what's called a spread or facing pages. You should notice this little black line here is the seam between page two and three. If I put anything over that black line, it goes across page two and page three. The worst design faux pas in the history of design is when someone puts a photo across page two and page three and they fold and staple the magazine. And when you open up the magazine, you get a weird overlapping image between the two pages. It's because they really didn't plan that fold out very well that you get people's head cut off or something important on that black line. So notice, even though this is really long, that's page two and page three, which also should make you realize that this is now 11 inches tall and 17 inches across because it's two eight and a half by 11 documents. So if I was printing this document, remember four goes and touches one. So this in theory is 11 by 17 and 11 by 17. So if I printed what's called duplex, printed a document on both sides of the pages, right? I would print this in 11 by 17 on both sides of the piece of paper, even though this is four pages of eight and a half by 11, if that makes sense. Page four touches page one, which means this is front cover, this is back cover, this is interior spread. If you take the sleeve of a book off of the book and it's hardbound, the thing that you open up the book jacket is bigger than the book, right? It's the front and back and also the spine and the interior flaps. Everything is in that book cover. Well, guess what? That thing was laid out in InDesign and all of those pieces were documents butted up against each other for the final output of the document, right? Front, back, flaps. Just know that this looks more complicated is. It's four eight and a half by 11 documents, but this page is touching that page in its final export. And so your chapter like five or six is a newsletter and that's where you get multiple pages you have to explore. Most of your first couple of chapters are just documents that have more than one side to them, like a postcard, a front and a back to the postcard or a simple poster or flyer that has a picture and text on top of it. But know that this little spine here is because it is a folded multi-page document. Okay, all right, so now if I want elements to appear on every single page, left or right or both, I need to put those elements in the master. The way I 
get to the master, you notice that page two is blue. If I double click on it, page three is blue. If I double click on page four, page four is blue. That means that I'm on that particular page inside my InDesign file. If I want to get to the master, I have to double click up here in one of these two pages of the master. Also know if I put anything now on one of these two pages, they are going to appear on every single page because I am in the master. If I wanna put something only on page number one, I need to double click on page number one to make sure that I'm not in the master. Now, when you're creating a multi-page document, the very first place you should go is the master. You should start with the elements that appear on every single page and from there, put those pieces in and then go into the individual pages and put the stuff that doesn't appear on every single page. So like when you set up a Word document, you set the number of pages and everything and you get that thing set up, set up right off the get go, right? If you're doing PowerPoint, you really should set up the master slide with your logo and your basic background and stuff before you actually put the presentation together. That way you have a framework to work around or work inside of. If you do web design, you really should build the template before you build all of the pages because all of the pages will be based on the template. Same concept. The only difference is this is a multi-page environment for well, it was for print, but now we have so many books online that the print has become interactive PDF or EPUB. But still think of this as a multi-page print environment, newsletters, magazines, books, textbooks, uh, newspapers, uh, brochures, pamphlets, anything that's multiple pages. So we're gonna go into the master and see what happens when we put elements that are going to appear on every single page. So let's double click the left master. So a master, and you'll notice that there is a dash master and each one of these pages has a little a in the corner. Know that in advanced in design, you can have more than one master. And why is that important? Well, remember, sometimes you look in a magazine and there's a different color palette per the articles that you're reading, or there's a book that has a different look based on the chapter that you're in. What they did was they set up more than one master, an A master that might have a white background, a B master that might have a black background, a C master that might have a beige background. They use this environment where they did multiple masters so that they could make each of their multiple pages have a different A, B, C, D up in the corner. So you can do a lot in a multi-page document in one place in InDesign. And that's why they, people use InDesign. You can put it in one place and it appears everywhere. And if you need to make a change across a 64 page document, you can change it in one place and it will change it on all 64 documents. Maybe you have dreams that you wanna write your own novel and you named it The Ramblings of Chip. Uh -huh. uh, but maybe the publisher was like, gosh, that's a terrible name. It should be the genius of Chip. Then you could change it in the master and it would have changed it on all 64 pages. So InDesign is beautiful for multi-page layout. So traditionally, multi-page has headers and footers, right? The top piece of the document and the bottom piece of the document. So just keep that in mind because that's kind of what this thing is. It's kind of like a header above the columns and a footer below the columns. Remembering that the columns is where text, te text and pictures go. So you don't wanna put stuff that appears on every single page inside of the columns, because when you go to the actual pages themselves, the columns is where you put the pictures and the text that is specific to the page. So anything in the master should either A, be just like a background color or a background graphic, something you put stuff on top of, or B, be stuff that you put in the margin so that it doesn't affect what's in the columns on the individual pages, right? It's a container program. All we're doing is dumping pictures and text into a document and putting it to the front, sending it to the back, or putting it together. It's just a collage program. That's all InDesign is. If you really wanna make beautiful pictures, you make them in Photoshop. 
and you place them in InDesign. If you really wanna make a nice illustration, a logo, some vector graphic, you make it an illustrator and you bring it into InDesign to use it in a multi-page environment. So when they lay out a magazine, the Photoshop work for the cover and for the articles and for everything that's in there, this picture base was created in Photoshop and imported or placed in InDesign. Any illustrations, any logo work, any uh, cute little characters created an illustrator and placed in InDesign to make it a multi-page environment. Everything gets compiled in InDesign, not necessarily created originally in InDesign. So that's why I say it's a simple program. The heavy lifting for Photoshop photos is done in Photoshop. The heavy lifting for illustration work is done in Illustrator. All InDesign is for is to combine all the elements in one place for print output and or interactive online output, e-newsletters, e-postcards, uh, e-banners, uh, electronic magazines, textbooks, that sort of thing. Your textbooks for this class created in InDesign. Interactive elements added in InDesign and exported as an interactive PDF. Everything in the multi-page environment always created in InDesign. It's the best place for the master environment and it's the best place for flowing text. Those two things are really important in multi-page because if you remove a paragraph from page number 10, you want to make sure that 11 through 82 flows correctly, right? If you cut a paragraph out and you have to manually reflow everything for every page after that paragraph, you might as well start crying now and don't stop crying until you finish your project because it would be a nightmare to do. Okay. All right. So we need to add a few elements into our master environment so you can see how the master works. I wanna write, uh, we're gonna write Baskin Robbins. We're gonna put a page number on the master. We're gonna name the article, uh, the history of 31 flavors. I think that's what they call that. I think that's their stick, 31 flavors, right? Or something like that. Uh, so we're gonna add some elements that would be on every page if we were making this like an article, a little pamphlet about Baskin Robbins. I may be really hungry by the end of this lecture because if we see enough pictures of really good looking ice cream, uh, it's probably, but if you're at home, maybe you can have a little snack break. Uh, okay, so the first thing we have to do is add some text. We're gonna add some color and stuff just to kind of play around, but just add some elements to the master just so you can see how it works. Traditionally, the name of the article is in the lower left-hand spread of pages. So down here, we should say Baskin Robbins. Somewhere up on the top margin, we should say the name of the article because it's normally on the top. And the page number is traditionally on odd pages down in the lower right hand corner. That's kind of the, just a traditional layout of an article or a newsletter. So the first thing we have to do is add the name Baskin Robbins somewhere in the lower left hand corner of uh, our multi-page or multi-spread environment here. So we have to pick the text tool. This is a very simple program. Most of what we're gonna do is the text tool, the container tool, and the shape tool. That's it. You can do wonders with those three things. These other things start to make the program a little more complicated. The basics of it are the selection tool, the direct select tool, which we saw in Illustrator, the container tool, a big box that we put stuff in, the shape tool, which we saw in Illustrator, where you can make circles and squares and put color inside of them. Know that InDesign works like Illustrator. It has a fill and a stroke, just like Illustrator. Color in the shape, color on the edge of the shape. Same in situation, because InDesign thinks in a vector world. It thinks like a vector. It accepts photos, raster, but it thinks like vector. If you're creating something in InDesign, it's trying to create it so that it's scalable. It's thinking vector. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is we have to create text. So we're gonna take the little T tool, which is right here, the type tool, and we're gonna move our mouse down right below the little margin area and watch, I'm gonna click and hold my mouse down and draw a little box. And I'm gonna draw it all the way across the first column. And I'm gonna stop right in the middle of that gutter area. 
and I'm gonna let go. Now, you're gonna notice if I zoom in that this little box has a container, right? This is a container. And like I was explaining before, InDesign works in containers, either text containers or picture containers. Now, all I did was go from my text tool, and that's what yours looks like, to my selection arrow so you can see what the container looks like. And the container is a frame, so I can adjust it just like I adjust my bounding box in Illustrator. Same concept, has little handles on the end that have rotation, have scale, same thing as Illustrator. The only difference is we're doing text and pictures and that's it. Okay, so if you selected the container just to see what I see, we need to go back to the text tool and watch when I move my text tool inside the box, it goes from the, do you wanna draw another text box icon to the, do you want to click in here to select text icon? So we want to select text. So we're going to click in there. And you're going to notice I have a little dancing cursor, just like Word, just like Publisher, just like PowerPoint, any program that has text, this little dancing cursor saying, do you want to type in some words? Yes, I do. I want to type in some words. And you'll probably notice that by default, it has a little black T over here. If we are not in text container world, that's a little square that is fill. But when you're using text tool, the fill turns into text color or fill color for your text. Only difference, you'll see two icons down there, either text color or fill color. It's just based on which tool you have drawn with in InDesign. So, okay, so we have that selected and we're just gonna type in Baskin. Robins, and it has two Bs. So capital B-A-S-K-I-N space Robins, capital R-O-B-B-I-N-S, right? Baskin Robins. Now, with the text tool selected and the cursor still dancing, let's go over to the properties tab instead of the pages tab, because we've seen the properties tab from Illustrator, We've seen the properties tab from Photoshop, right? When you select a specific tool or select an object in your document, you either have properties on the right-hand side or properties at the top of the page. If you had web design with me, you had properties down the bottom of the page. It's all the same. It's just what is the properties based on the object you have selected or what you've created. Now, you'll notice you have the fill color. You have no stroke. And I'm going to only say this one. I am anti-stroke on text because when you add colors, strokes to the edge of text, it eats in the fill of the letters. So if you add a stroke to the outside of a letter that's really skinny, like I, it makes it really hard to read the I because the stroke ends up being as much as the color inside the shape. So I do not add strokes to my text for any way, shape, form, reason, anything. If I need a shadow or a glow or something to make it stand out, I do that. I do not add strokes around my letters if I at all can help it. So you'll notice the fill color is black. It has no stroke, which means no points, no lines around it. And it has a character and it has a paragraph. If you've ever used Word or any document, you know character styles and you know paragraph alignment. This is no different than Word. InDesign is just a designer's version of Word or Publisher. It just is better for designing. But honestly, you could use either of those programs and create really nice multi-page documents too. InDesign's just a little bit better because it accepts Photoshop files, it accepts Illustrator files, it just accepts things in Adobe world that Word doesn't play as good with, it's not as friendly with, but it doesn't mean you can't do it in those programs either. All right, now that we have our text typed in, let's go to typography 101, a little bit better, and let's make the word Baskin bold. So let's just highlight it like you would in Word, click and drag, highlight the word Baskin, and change your font to bold. And you'll notice 
only Baskin turned to bold. I mean, this is just like Word. I mean, InDesign, why I said, I think it's an easier program for most people. Everyone at some point in time has written a document in some document program. The text tool is exactly the same. So let's make Robin's italic. So we'll highlight it. We'll make it italic. Now, just for fancy purposes, let's click our cursor in front of the capital R and hit delete. And let's make it all one word. Baskin bold, Robin's italic. Baskin bold, Robin's, and I don't even care what typeface you use. Minion is normally the default. So if that's your typeface, then you can just leave it as your default. Now, once we've typed in that word, let's highlight the entire word. And you'll notice that the family member disappears because we had bold and italic. So it doesn't know what we're doing, but it does let us make it a little bit bigger. So let's click the up arrow and make it 14 point. Now, 14 point gives us a little bit of the bigger typeface on it and give, gives it a little bit bigger. So now we have it a little bit bigger, a little bit thicker, one part bold, one part italic, a little bit bigger than the default. The paragraph default is 12 point, which is what most newsletters, textbooks, that sort of thing is 12 point. If it's for larger readers, it's 14 point, 16 point, something like that. If it's small print, you normally get 11 point or 10 point font. I don't know how anyone reads that small, their small print books where they print them in less pages because they put more words on a page. Dear Lord, my eyes are like killing me after reading like 10 pages in a small print book. God bless whoever reads those. Okay, all right, so we have it edited and you'll notice that the fill is a black T. So if we double clicked on that, you'll notice that it gives us the default CMYK colors to pick from. Everyone's like, oh my gosh, it only gives you paper black CMYK colors, right? It's a print environment. It's a print environment that we're working in. So it wants to print in the four color process. I'll show you in a minute how to create a custom color down here, custom swatch that you could then could use in your design on top of the standard CMYK colors. But these are the cartridges you get when you go to the buy cartridges for your printer, right? You has black and then you open it up and it normally has cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. All the colors are based on those colors that get mixed together when you're printing your photos and stuff on your printer. It's also the thing that gives me a heart attack when I go to Target and the cost of the ink is as much as the printer. And I'm like, well, why don't I just buy a new printer? Why am I spending $55 on ink when a new printer is $69.99? <laughs> I could have a brand new printer. My kids had some things to print the other day and I had to go to Target to get ink. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I could buy a new printer for the cost of the ink just so I can print the flyer. You have to take to school. This is crime, highway robbery. Okay, I feel like buying a new printer every time I need new ink, which is completely ridiculous, but they kind of make it where they want you to throw away the old printer and buy new ink with a new printer. I mean, they force you to do it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a crime. Okay, all right. So we have our black text, bold, italic, 14 point basic stuff. Let's go back to our selection arrow. Back to our selection arrow. Because, right? Because I said this is a container. So watch when I grab the corner and I shrink this down, but I still say outside of the text. The container, all I did was shrink the size of the container, but I can still see my text. This is a really important thing to understand in InDesign. If I'm doing titles to something, or I'm doing just a simple blurb, a word, a, a, a title, a caption, you want to make sure the box isn't any bigger than the text that you're doing because you want the flexibility to move this thing around and not have it be over top of other things box wise inside your document. So this container can just be moved, right? This thing is just a box that has text inside of it. Now, the boxes I use for the text that I'm flowing in my columns, I want that to box to be the full size of the column because I want my text to fill up this column 
because I'm maximizing the amount of words I can put on a page. But if it's the title of the book or it's a caption for the book, I want the box to be smaller to like the size. Because imagine if I got a bunch of text boxes on here and this one is the full size, I might not be able to click on the one behind it because this box is really big. So for file management, best practice box management in InDesign, if it's a single word or phrase, let's just keep it a little bit smaller. Okay, and you'll notice that I can click and drag it. You may also notice if I make this box smaller than the text, I get a little red plus symbol on the box that says you have text outside of this container. You have text inside of here, you just can't see it. That becomes really important and we're actually gonna see it when we add body text or big amounts of text because that's what's called text flowing or text wrapping in InDesign that allows us to flow text one from one container to the next. So that's an important thing to see. If you're ever laying lots of text in a document and you click on any of the text frames and it has a little red plus, it means there's some words inside of your article or your multiple pages that the world can't see because it's hidden behind the text box. It won't be an issue when you flow your text from one text box to the next because the red plus will never appear because as you make the text box smaller, it'll push the words to the next text container because it's what's called text flowed from one back box to the next. The documents that you deal with inside of your chapters, the text has already been flown, flowed from one box to the other. You just got to know that that does exist because if you're creating something from scratch and you make it too small of a box for one container and you didn't connect the next container to it, you won't see it. It'll be hidden behind the box. So flowing your text from one box to the other is the key to multi-page layout and is the key to InDesign. Okay, so let's make sure we have our box selected and let's make sure it's a reasonable size, just bigger than the text. And for the sake of it, let's move it down below the column border or the margin of the column, but not all the way down to the bottom of the page. So let's just park it somewhere kind of in the middle of that column. So somewhere just like that. So now let's see what that looks like on page two and four. So let's go over to our pages tab and let's double click on page two and see if it appears down there. You can zoom in, you can zoom out. It should be in the corner because it's on our left master. So if I double click on page four, it should be in the corner. We put it on the left master, which means pages two and pages four have that element. If I want something on the right master, I have to go up and double click on the right page on the master. I could do this lecture a million times, record it, post it out there, and someone is going to put a photo on left or right master that they only want to appear in the document itself, and they can't figure out why they can't click on it in the document to delete it. It's because it's on the master. So if I double click on page number two and click on this, I can't delete it, right? I can't click on it. It's on the master. If I'm on page number two, I can't click on that element. It's on the master. If I wanna select it, I have to go to the master and click on it. There are ways to override the master and click on it on page two and four, but we don't need to talk about that because you'll override all your masters and then you'll be deleting stuff you should not delete. So. For the sake of the process, you have to select it in the master if it's a master element. Okay, so that brings us over to the right master. Let's double click on the right master. So we're over here, because we're gonna put a page number down here in the lower right hand corner on our master. If you do this on page two or three, when we insert the page number, you're gonna see page one or page three where there should be a a, because A is actually the auto page number symbol. So make sure you're on the right master. Double click on the right master. We're gonna use our text tool and we're gonna draw another text box in the lower right hand corner. 
just like we did for our left master. So use the text tool and draw a text container. I'm gonna zoom in just so that you can see it has the little dancing cursor, just like when we typed in Baskin Robbins. If your chapter asks you to edit something that appears on every page, you have to go to the master to edit it. If you click a million times on that object on any page of the document, you are not gonna get it. And you're gonna get really frustrated. Click, 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 why can't I touch this thing? It's because it appears on every page and it's in the masters. Even if you right click it, it's gonna give you nothing because it's not an object you can select because it's in the master not on the pages of the document. You can conquer the world if you understand what needs to go on the master and what needs to go in the document itself. You can conquer the world, just those two things. Okay, so we need to type in the word page, P-A-G-E, and a space. Now, if we type in a one, if we type in a one, and I go over to page number one, I look like a hero. If I go to page number three, I no longer look like a hero. That's because there are special symbols or special characters in InDesign that have code behind the scenes that helps you out in the process of making things number themselves and other special characters, form fields you type into. They're all called what's called special characters. Well, page numbering happens to be a special character. So let's do page, hit the space bar, and then we're going to go up to type. Now, type is where you find anything you would like to do as far as letters, numbers, and symbols are concerned. So you're going to see things like type on a path and insert footnotes and hyperlinks and cross-referencing, uh, space holder text, but you're also going to see something that says special character. Now, the beauty about InDesign is because it lets you insert symbols and all kinds of cool things that are actual text characters that can be exported as an interactive PDF. And they look like anybody could do it, any symbols, things that other computers don't have, but your InDesign file has. You can use special characters for really cool things. So things like copyright symbols and registration marks, all those little things you see on ads and, and uh, multi-page documents, something as simple as a trademark, the little TM, that's actually a text character. And the reason it's crystal clear, even when it's itty, 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 bitty next to a logo is because it was inserted in Illustrator or InDesign. It was an actual text character. Your computer didn't need to know that it was a subscript or a superscript or it was a special thing. All it does is see it as a really nice TM or a circle with an R inside of it or a circle with a C inside of it or any of those special characters. Now, what you'll also notice if we go down one to markers, you can do page numbering in your document by selecting just a simple character. And we actually wanna do current page number because we're gonna number our document. On the right hand side are the odd pages of our entire document, whether it was one or 350. And my kids always laugh at me, they're teenagers, that when I go to the go to the bookstore or library and I pick up a book and it's over 400 pages, I'm like, ooh, because they know I don't love to read and it's gonna take me forever to read 400 pages. So I kept the Lincoln book to 370 pages or so, knowing that that was one that I could read in a reasonable amount of time. My kids, they read these books, they're 600 pages. I don't even know how they do it. They read, you know, any number of the Harry Potters or any of the books that were lots of books in a sequence. And they're like 700 page books. And at like 12, they read them and they put them on their shelf. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't remember the last time I've read a 700 page book. I may have never read a 700 page book. So, but you don't have to number the pages. Once you put a current page number next to page space, you're gonna see an uppercase a, that's a symbol that just means auto numbering. So now if I go to page number one, I look like a hero because it says page number one. 
If I double click on page number three, I'm a hero because it says page number three. InDesign is beautiful for multi-page situations, which means auto numbering, things that appear on every page, the master template setup, having multiple masters, which means the page numbering could be red in chapter one, and the page numbering could be blue in chapter two, and the page numbering could be red in chapter three. I mean, it's really beautiful for multi-page design. If your company says, oh, you've learned a little bit of design, can you lay out our newsletter for us? You say, yes, but you need to buy me InDesign so that I can lay the newsletter out in a multi-page environment. So you don't have to type your company name on every single page. You don't have to struggle with the multi-page environment. It's all right here. So let's double click and go back to our master because I want the page to be bold and italic. So I want the page number itself to be bold and italic. So watch when I highlight it, I have the same options I had when I type a regular text box in. So special characters can be bold. They can be italic. They can be a different color than everything else. All it is is a scripted letter form that is used in InDesign. If you've ever used Publisher, it has the same tools, Word auto numbers your pages and stuff too. And you can change that in the header and the footer. Nothing different. You just got to kind of know that in the type, it's called a special character. I think Word calls it a special character too, but. Okay, so let's make it bold and italic. So I wanna make the page numbers bold and italic because for us older folk, we like to be able to see the page number better than the other text. So I'm gonna highlight the A and I'm gonna make it bold and italic. And maybe I wanna make page itself just italic. So I'm just showing you, this is no different than Word or any other text program. The only difference is it's a really good multi-page environment. Okay, so we have Baskin Robbins written on the left footer in essence. We have the page number on the right footer, all in our master, right? Because we want it to appear on every single page. So let's select our selection arrow just so that we have the text box selected. And I'm gonna scroll down in our properties palette because I want to right align the text box. So you notice just like in probably Word, if you ever used Word before, you can change the location of the text inside the box, right, left, middle, and right. Why is that important? Because when you're aligning things in InDesign or a multi-page, you want to make sure you're aligning it to an invisible edge. And in InDesign, the individual edge is the left, the top, the bottom, and the right of a column. So I just want to make sure the page number is aligned to the right side of my right column. And I also want to move it down a little bit so it's kind of in the middle of the page. So I'm just gonna move this one down a little bit too. And I'll also notice that I use my scroll bar. So I actually overrode my features here. So let's go back and make these the way I wanted them. It changed my typeface. So I'm gonna scroll down real quick cause I gotta go back to, what were we using? Minion or something? Minion Pro. So let me go back so that I'm in the same. I used my scroll bar by mistake when I had my type selected and it scrolled me, scrolled me all the way through my typeface. So I just wanna make sure I go back to my Minion Pro, just so that it looks the same as it did that you guys were using. That's the one negative with scroll bar. Once you get into type, you can spin your scroll bar and it'll go through every font in your font book. All right, so we should have page and italic, page number, which is a capital. This always freaks people out when they first learn InDesign. Why does it say page number one? And they get frustrated. It's because it's a special character. And when you're on the master, it doesn't know the page number. But if I went into, my page number one and drew a text box and typed in page space. And then I went and insert special character, current page number, it would put a one, not an A. The A is only there because it's in the master of A master. If I went in and did insert current page in my page numbers, it would put the page number of the page I'm on. It knows, it's already coded. 
the master makes it a space holder. If you did that inside page one, two, three, or four, it would put the actual page number it is. Why is that important? Because maybe you wanted for some reason to number one page on the left-hand side of the page. Well, if it was page 12, you could go in and type in page space, insert current page number, and it would put a 12 where the A is on all the odd pages because I went into the actual page itself to put a page number. And sometimes they do that because the photo is covering the page number on the right-hand side. And so they want to number one of the left-hand pages just so that when people are flipping through a magazine or a book or whatever, they could find their bearings of what page they're on. So sometimes they go out of the norm and they number an even page, even though it's only the odd pages that are numbered because a photo is covering the page number or something. Uh, but that's the auto page numbering system. So now let me go back to my pages. So if I double click on page three, it should be italic. It should be bold italic for the number three. If I double click on page number one, it should say page number one. You'll notice that page four is a left page. So if I double click on it, there is no page number on the right side of the left page. Remember, it's only on the odd pages. So I got to scroll over and see Baskin Robbins over there, right? Header, footer, masters is where I put everything I need. Well, I need to put the name of the article in the upper right hand corner of the left master. So the left master is over here, right? I'm holding my space bar down so I can pan and I need to go up to the top here. Remember, we need to use a text box and we need to draw it up here so that we can write uh, the history of 31 flavors is what I wanna put as the name of the article, the history of 31 flavors. Now, we don't want the text box to sit on this pink line because our text for the article is going to start in the upper left hand corner of the column. So we need to do what we did in the footer and draw a text box that goes across part of this column, but does not touch the top of the document or the bottom of the document. So I'm going to use my text tool. I'm going to draw a text container. Once I draw the container, I'll get a little dancing cursor in there. And I want to type in the history of 31 flavors, period. Now, traditionally, it's upper and lower case when you do the title of an article or something like that, because it isn't really a sentence. It's a statement. And sometimes there isn't even a period. It's just the statement of the history of 31 flavors. I kind of like to put a period if it actually looks like it could be a sentence so you don't freak out. So if I was doing the cover page design, I had a really nice photo, a logo of Baskin Robbins. The cover page would say the name of the article, right? The history of 31 flavors would appear on page one because it's the cover page of the article. Then I would have my interior spread and I would have something on the back. And in most cases, maybe the uh, the picture of the founding person would go across page number one and go on to page number four because it's the back cover of the brochure or the article. But just know that this is appearing on page two and three or page two in this document. And it would appear on page four if the article bled to page four. Okay, so here's where you can make any text that you want. So make something bold, make it italic. Uh, do something with the properties of this little statement to give it a little personality. The choice is yours. I'm personally going to do uh, bold 31 because that's like their thing, the number 31. Maybe flavors. I want to make italic. You can play around with it. Just I want you to edit it a little bit so that you've customized the text, just so that you're comfortable in the text palette. So maybe I'll make just the H semi bold. And you'll notice my text box is not sitting on the pink line. Yeah. Why can I not bold certain things? Makes like I literally use, I'm literally this font that I chose, I can't bold it. Well, it depends on the font you chose. Not all fonts have bold. Or italic? Not all fonts have so italic. Some of them I have to like choose one that has bold if I want yes. to. Yes. Yeah, like from typography class, ideally you want to pick a typeface that has a big family, set of family members. I made the comment, like the more kids you have in your family, right, the bigger the party. Well, it's the same with fonts. If you choose a typeface that is only script, 
There's no bold, there's no italic, there's no any family members. So I like to stay in more traditional typefaces, Times New Roman, Helvetica, Ariel, Tahoma, the main, Garamond, the main ones, because they have family members. Yeah. Yeah, that's the trick with typography is there's not always total number of family, not a lot of family members. So for me, when I'm designing with type, I try to definitely pick typefaces that have a decent number of family members. So there's my typeface. I went back to my selection arrow, make sure it's kind of aligned to the left and make sure it isn't touching the top of your column. We want it somewhere in the middle here so that when we put text and we flow text that, uh, that it doesn't infringe on our column, our text column. And that's headers and footers in Word. So this is basic text document layout. So if you've ever used Word before, we're doing the same stuff. We're just doing it in more of a design multi-page environment. Your book you open up, it's gonna have multiple pages and pictures and text already combined. It's gonna have pictures, it's gonna have text, it's gonna have shapes. Everything's already gonna be in there. You just gotta know where you're looking in the master or in the page itself to edit or replace whatever the book is asking you. It has a, a, a box drawn around the coupon that has dashed lines on it. You just have to know to select the box because it's a shape drawn in there and the shape has properties. You just gotta make sure you know, are you selecting an object that exists only on one particular page or are you trying to select something that exists on every page? Just to make sure you're in the right place in your multi-page environment. It's as simple as that, but it can be complicated too because there's a lot you can do with text boxes. There's a lot you can do with shapes and there's a lot you can do with stuff you bring in from other programs that all get compiled in one location, a container program, which in this case is called InDesign. If you're making a newsletter for your company and you have no designers on staff and you're just asking someone that used multi-page document for, they're gonna use Word. They're gonna try to do the exact same things we're doing here. It's just a bigger struggle in Word because you don't have the layout tools we have that InDesign has. Simple program, but you can do complex things with it. Okay, all right, so we have text. Let's make sure that we're on our pages tab. So if we double click on page number two, it should say the history of flavors in the upper left-hand corner, and it should say Baskin Robbins in the lower right-hand corner. If I scroll over to page three, it should say page three in the lower right-hand corner. Are we okay? All right, good. All right, so I'm gonna do command minus or whatever, just to zoom out a little bit. So you can see in the scheme of things, page one is numbered page one, page two has the history of 31 flavors in Baskin Robbins, page three has only page three, and page four has the history of 31 flavors in Baskin Robbins. So the elements on the even page should be on two and four, the elements on the right master should be on page one and three, that's it. That's all we've done so far. Okay, we're gonna do one last thing in our master just so that you can see text and colors that you wanna have on every single page you wanna put in your master environment. If you have a postcard project, the background color is already gonna be drawn in the master and the pictures and text are just gonna be on top of it. If there's a shape or a line or a stroke or an image that appears on every page, it's gonna be already placed inside of your InDesign file inside of your document in the master. Just know that when you download the student files, the InDesign file and the pictures are all in one folder. This is a container program, which means if you delete the photo, it doesn't appear in the InDesign because all it is is a preview box of the picture that exists somewhere else. And we're gonna see it when we put pictures in the program. So you don't want to move or delete anything that's inside the folder that you download for chapter one, two, three, or four, because they are together. They're the root directory folder. Everything's got to be in the same place. So if I save this document, which I'm going to save right now, I want to save it into my lecture folder because that's where all the pictures I'm going to use are in the lecture folder. So before we go any further, let's save this document so we can see what it looks like. Let's do a file save as, and we're gonna name this file, our last name, don't name it McRoy, that's my last name. 
And I like to do underscore. So shift and the minus on the keyboard and lecture three. And let's make sure we're saving it into our lecture three files. That way, if you take this with you, if you have a thumb drive or something, everything exists in the same folder. So if you're saving it, make sure you save it into the lecture three folder. So if you downloaded your thumb drive, make sure you're saving it in that folder. Make sure you unzipped it so that you can get into your folder. And if you didn't unzip it, make sure you unzip the file that we downloaded from the lecture announcement. And if you unzipped it, make sure you unzip it to the desktop so that you have it in a place where you can save it. So I'm gonna click save. Now, if I double click on my lecture folder, there should be an InDesign file in there. And there's also this really scary looking file that says IDLK, and that is the temporary file just saying that your InDesign file is currently opened. That disappears when you close your InDesign file. So don't freak out, that's just a file that's generated, that's a temporary file saying that your InDesign file is open. That's also a really good thing because InDesign has an auto save feature where it will save itself after a certain amount of time and not give you a super heartache. I actually worked for an engineering firm uh, very early on in my design days. And I was working on a proposal for a job in Naples to build a master plan community. And it was about a $40 million job. And I was putting together the proposal to plan this huge community. And wouldn't you know it, I'm an InDesign and it was, gosh, it was a huge document. It had to be 120 pages. A car hit the generator in the parking lot and wiped the electricity out of the entire building. And I hadn't saved the file in a little while. And I started to have a nervous breakdown and the power came back on, the power company showed up, they turned it back on. I opened up InDesign and it said, would you like to start working on it again from where you previously had it open? And I was like, by Jesus, I do, <laughs> I want to open it. And it opened it up with all of my features that I had worked on previously that I hadn't saved in temporary memory of the InDesign file. So that ID document just is its backup autosave document that happens in InDesign. Did you find your zip file? All right. I'm gonna pop out just for a second to help a student and I'll be right back. All right, I'm back. All right, so now let's create a shape. Now, InDesign is a container program, which means if I wanna draw shapes, make cool colors, uh, draw illustrations, create cool photos, I wanna do that in Photoshop and Illustrator. InDesign is a container program. With that being said, it does have a basic line segment tool. It does have a basic shape tool. It has some basic pen, pencil, some very basic drawing tools. So we're gonna do a couple of shapes just so that you can see that, that you can create shapes in InDesign. Let's go to the master. So we're gonna double click on the master. 
and we're going to go to the right master. I'm going to zoom that zoom in a little bit and go to the bottom of the right master. So right, so we have page A down there and we have the two columns and we're just going to draw a line across the bottom of the page, just so that you can see there are basic drawing tools. So if you know anything from the line segment tool, holding on shift in Illustrator is how you draw a straight line. So if I wanna draw a straight line from the left edge of the left column, over to right next to the page number. I want to take the line segment tool and I'm going to click my mouse and hold down shift and I'm going to draw a line across. If you don't hold down shift, just draw, drag it straight across and you can move your arrow up and down and it will actually move it for you. So let's just draw a line. So there it is. So you can see it right here, my line segment tool. See how I'm clicking and dragging? If I hold down shift, it goes straight. If I don't hold down shift, I can draw it on any angle that I want. So I just held down shift to draw a straight line. Now, once you draw that line, go to your global selection arrow. Go back to your regular selection arrow. And you'll notice that the line has nodes. Right, it has nodes. So I can actually make the line longer or make the line shorter by just clicking on one corner and dragging it. So I want you to make the line go over to right next to page or page number A. So I want you to make the line go over to close to page number A. And I want you to use your selection arrow and I want you to just move it so that it lines up kind of to the left side of your left column. So look, if I use the line segment tool and I click and hold my mouse down and hold shift, I draw a straight line. Once I let my mouse go, it's whatever the length was I dragged. Once I go to my selection arrow, I can move the line or I can make the line longer or shorter. Very simple drawing tool, just like you would use in Illustrator. It's actually the exact same tool you would use in Illustrator. And remember from the line segment that it has only a stroke to it, right? Only a stroke to it, not a fill because it's a line segment. So if I double click on the stroke color, so see how I have this line selected? So I want this line down here to go across my right master. And I also wanna make it light blue. I'm gonna double click on the stroke swatch. I'm just gonna go over here and pick a light blue. This is just a spectrum, all right? It's just a spectrum. So you'll notice that we can pick any shades of color. And you'll also notice that the CMYK colors percentages are changing based on the color. So just pick a blue. I don't even care what color blue. Just click around your spectrum until you get to the cool shades of your spectrum and then pick a shade of blue, any shade of blue. And click okay. So select your line segment. You can drag it to any line distance you want, right? You go down here to the stroke double click on that swatch and you get your color spectrum and you pick whatever color you want. I'm just picking blue, even though brown and pink, I think are the colors for uh, Baskin Robbins. They got some blue in there too. So uh, let's just pick a shade of blue, right? Are we okay? So we have a shade of blue. Now, if you don't have your swatches palette, up here, let's go to our window drop down and make sure that we have our swatches palette open. And you'll notice under color, something called swatches. So just make sure your little swatches palette is visible. The reason we're doing that is because I wanna show you this little custom blue color you made, which is right here on the stroke. You can click on that swatch here, and it is our master color here. So you see that it's, it appears right here. 
If I double click over here, it's right here. So it's appearing in both location, right? But look here, add CMYK swatch. If I click on that, it appears down here. So even though InDesign opens with only standard cyan, magenta, yellow, you can make any color you want. And as long as you pick it from the fill or the stroke and you add it to your library, it becomes a color you can use over and over again. That's really important because I want you to change the color of the text for the name of the article. So you remember the name of the article is right here. If we double click on it, you see this is the text and it's labeled as black, just like Word. So if you're highlighting in Word, you can change it to the new blue by clicking on the fill color and making it blue. InDesign is really important for two things. One is it lets you add pictures and text in multiple documents and make it really easy to flow it across documents. The second most important thing is you can make colors for a document, make them swatches and use the same color over and over again. So when you see a book, you see a magazine, all they have is a swatch library where they preset five colors, 10 colors, 20 colors. And that color is the same blue on page one as it is on page 120. A little trickier in Word than in InDesign, but the same concept. Color in one place appears on multiple pages. Okay, so we made a line one color and changed the font to a color. Let's draw a box and make that a color. Line same segment, text tool and shape tool are really the basic tools in InDesign. So we're gonna draw a rectangle. So that's the next thing we're gonna do. Still on the master, because we want it to appear on every single page. So make sure you're on your master and we're gonna do it on the left master. So we're gonna zoom in. I'm gonna use the space bar just so I can pan down. And I'm gonna draw a box using the rectangular shape tool right over top of the word Baskin Robbins. So I'm gonna click and drag a box right over top. And I don't care how big you make the box. You wanna make it all the way to the edge. You wanna to go to the edge of the column. You wanna to go to the gutter in between the columns. It doesn't matter to me. Just draw a box big enough down there and you're gonna see what happens. When you draw a shape, it has a fill and a stroke, right? A fill and a stroke. So let's go to the properties because that's where everything happens, right? The properties is where everything happens for shapes. So you're gonna notice the rectangle has a stroke of one in black and a fill of nothing. Well, I wanna remove the stroke from the box. So if I go right over here to the number and make it zero, you'll notice a red slash goes through the box, right? It has no stroke but I want it to have a fill. Well, well, looky here, we have our CMYK and we have our custom blue. I wanna make it a custom color. I don't wanna use one of the swatches that is already there. So I'm gonna go over to my fill box over here and I'm gonna double click on it just like I did for the text tool. So I can make a custom color in the text fill or I can make a custom color in the box fill. I can make a custom color in the stroke down here, right? So for the sake of the process, let's just make it a really light color. So I think I'm going to look for, uh, let's make it like a light yellow. So if you can find a light yellow somewhere in your spectrum. So click around your spectrum so you get to the warmer colors. And once you get to the warmer colors, pick a yellowish color, right? And let's add it to our swatch library. And click OK. And you're going to notice the box is yellow. And if we go over to our swatch library, by goodness, we have the light blue 
and we have the light yellow that we've created so far. So we have black, white, which is the color of the paper, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, which is Epson HP Color Mix World, and two custom colors. If you open up a chapter in your book, it's gonna have the standard colors in your swatch library and any custom colors. If you open a template, from InDesign, when you went to File, Open New, Print, and it gave you the templates, there will already be custom colors. The beauty about that is if you really like colors in the template, but you're making your own design, you can open up the template and copy the colors right out of the template. Designers post color palettes all over the internet for designs for print, and designers go in and they just grab the color swatches and they use them so that their color palette looks as nice as the template color palette. Okay, now make sure you have the global selection arrow selected, right? So we can select our box, there it is, right? Now, you're gonna notice that I drew the box second, so I can't see the words under the box, right? So I either have to do object, arrange, send to back, or I can right click on my object and do send to back under arrange, right? So right click is your friend. So if you draw an object, place an object, write an object in InDesign, and you use your global selection arrow, you can right click on that object and bring it to front, send it to back, add a drop shadow, rotate it, fit it to the object, all kinds of things can happen. Now, if your box doesn't go all the way to the edge, with your selection arrow, grab this little handle in the middle and drag it all the way to the edge so that it bleeds all the way to the bottom. I don't want it bleeding all the way to the column because the words are gonna run all the way down there. So make sure it doesn't do that. So just make sure it kinda is this shape. Now, let's see how good you did. And let's go to page two. And there should be a yellow stripe at the bottom of page two. You should go to page four and there should be a yellow stripe at the bottom. If it only appears on page two or page four, you did not put it on the master. Let's scroll over to page three and there should be a line that's blue that goes from the left over to page three. And if I double click on page one, it should be in the exact same location going from left to right. That's the beauty about the master. Wherever I placed it on the document on master right, it'll be in the exact same location on every odd page from one to 101. Same spot every single time. When you, when you flip a book, that page number is in the exact same location on every odd page or right page in your book. The reason that is, is because they put it in the master. If you want something to appear on every single page, you have to put it in the master. Okay, so we have successfully drawn a line segment, made a shape with color, put three text boxes on the left and right master. We used bold, we used italic, we changed the size of type and we did everything in our four page document that's gonna appear on every single page. Now we have to put elements that are only gonna appear on some of the pages. And that's the images I grabbed from Baskin Robbins. We're gonna go out to their website and copy some text just so you can see how it works. So we're gonna double click on page number one. And I'm gonna zoom out so I can see the whole document. So here it is. Now, there's one of two ways to bring a picture into InDesign successfully. Really two ways. If you're in Macworld, there's three ways because you can drag and drop everything in Macworld. PC World isn't as friendly with dragging and dropping. You can actually copy an object out of Illustrator and open up InDesign and without even saving the object, you can paste it 
into InDesign and it will make it transparent. It will make it vector and it will embed the object in the document as a smart object. InDesign is very smart for the sake of step-by-step. -step, there's really two ways to best practice place something inside of InDesign. The first is just going to file place. So file place. Now for file place, let's go to the lecture three files. And we're going to place in this image. So I'm going to actually turn it to icons from the view, which is right here. So if yours is under list, you can actually change it to icons. The reason I want to change it to icons is because I want you to see this little image right here, which is grayscale. It's also, if you can only see the list, it's the one that ends in dot two three. So if you can see the file name, it says 5.54.23, that's the image we want. But I'm gonna turn it to icon so you can see the picture. I wanna place this picture. So let's go in and do file, place, select that picture and click open. And you're gonna notice that my cursor turns into the picture I'm trying to place, right? The picture I'm trying to place. So if I just tap my mouse one time, right inside page one, it's gonna drop in the picture really big. It drops in the picture really big because InDesign works in 100% final output, which means it's a print program. So it's trying to place images in 300 DPI, eight and a half by 11 production. It's trying to print things, place them in what they would look like when you print them print world. Now, before I go any further, when InDesign works, it's in a multi-page environment. Because it's in a multi-page environment, it thinks you're going to have lots of pictures and lots of text over lots of pages. So from a RAM speed process, it actually runs your display performance in typical display, which means not the best quality of what the pictures will actually look like when you print them. It runs it in kind of preview view. It runs it in preview view so it can run it faster. Well, I typically work on really high powered computers. So when I am creating designs in InDesign, I change it to high quality. And now, before I do it, I'm gonna zoom in on this picture and show you what that picture looks like in typical. You can't see it on the projector that well, but it's very pixelated. If I go to view display performance, high quality, you're gonna notice that the picture sharpens up a little bit. It sharpens up because it's trying to show you what it would look like in high quality. So if I downloaded a picture from pexels.com and it was the big, 10 megabyte picture, super high quality, and I did file place in InDesign, it would be enormous. It would be enormous because those photos were taken for larger than eight and a half by 11 final output. They took the picture. So if you want to do 18 by 24 inch poster, you could still use the picture without having to blow it up. I took really big pictures from the internet and I screenshot them. So they're about 3,000 pixels, but they're not as big as really high quality pictures that you would have in pexels.com world where the pictures are really nice pictures. They're huge pictures. But you'll also notice when I place the image, it made it final output. So let's click on the picture and delete it. And let's do that again, but let's do file, place. Let's select the same picture. Let's do open. And remember the cursor appears. Let's click our mouse and drag a box across only the size of our document and let go. And you're gonna notice the picture comes in only at the size of it free transformed it proportionately based on the size you needed for your design. So if you don't do that and keep your document the way it is, and you just do file place and you place the picture in there and it's really big, you have to use transform 
to make it smaller. You have to use transform to make it smaller because I'm going to show you in a second. I'm going to delete this and go back to the way you guys did it so you can see what happened when we made it only the size of our document. Right there it is. Now, if I use my selection arrow, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit, if I use my selection arrow and grab the lower right hand corner and pinch this box in, it's a container with a picture in it, which means the blue box is the container. If I make the container smaller, it doesn't make the picture smaller, it makes the box smaller. Hmm. So this thing has to be at least as big as the picture, right? Has to be at least as big as the picture. But see the problem? Too small, too big, just right. Now, if the box is too small, but it's too small because that's the size I want it for the layout. I can only have a picture that big, but my picture is too big for that thing. You notice this little circle right in the middle with your selection arrow, click on that circle and an orange box is created. The orange box is the picture in the box. So when I say InDesign is a container program, that means the blue box is the container, the orange box is the picture in the container. So if I wanna move the picture around in the container, I grab that little circle and I can move it. My arrow keys, I can move it. Am I changing the size of the container? No, I'm only cropping the picture in the container. If I wanna change the size of the container, I have to deselect by tapping away from the picture and click on it to get back to the blue box. Does that make sense? The orange box is the picture in the container. The blue box is the container itself. Why is that important? Because in layout, when you're doing multiple or multi-page design, I'm actually gonna delete this box and you can delete it too, because I'm gonna show you the other way that designers place objects, pictures inside of a document. We're on page number one, right? We're all on page number one. I've decided I'm gonna pre-think out my layout for page number one. I want a picture to run through the middle of this document and I'm gonna put text above it and I'm gonna put text below it. Down here, there are called frame tools picture frame tools. The frame tool is how you can frame out where you want your pictures to go. So we're going to pick the rectangular frame tool. So I can click and file place and just tap my cursor and the picture goes in 100% whatever it is. If I do that, I have to know that I have to make the frame smaller and I might have to move the picture or make the picture smaller. If I click file, place, and tap and draw a box on the document, it means the picture will go into the size of the box I drew. In magazine world, in newsletter world, really even in web design world, designers draw empty boxes that they put stuff in, right? So InDesign wants you to draw empty boxes. It wants you to draw boxes that you eventually will put pictures in. So when I do like a four page layout, I actually won't place any of the pictures in the four pages. I'll draw six containers or eight containers that I want the pictures to go into. So we're going to do that. Let's take the rectangular frame tool and I want you to draw a container across the middle of page one. The X means a link to something that isn't in the box yet. A link to something that isn't in the box yet. But while we're at it, let's double click on page number two and let's draw two small boxes. 
And while we're at it, let's double click on page number three and let's draw a medium sized box. So we have a box that goes through the middle of page number one. We have two small boxes on page number two, and we have a medium sized box on page number three. So that's telling our document we are putting four pictures inside of our four page document. It's also telling our document that they're only going to take up this much space. So if we use our selection arrow, we can actually move the container. This container is the same container that was created when we did file place and tapped our cursor and it just made the really big picture with the blue box. And it's the same blue container that was created when we did file place and we click and dragged the box when we did file place. Same container created three different ways. It's called a wireframe, just like in web design. So when you create a multiple page document, most designers do a wireframe where they place boxes where they want pictures to go. And then we're gonna drop in text around the pictures. That also means that, I don't know if you've ever seen movies before that took place in publishing world, but they would actually hold up the layouts and they would show, I need a picture for here. And we're putting words here. And the director, the art director or the marketing manager will say, this is the layout we have. We need you to give us parts for these little empty boxes. All it is, is a layout frame of the design. That also means that if you work for a magazine company, Gulf Shore in Naples, or you go to New York City and work for Oprah, their InDesign file is full of blue containers. Blue containers for text and X blue containers for pictures. And so when they go from the May issue to the June issue, they start with those containers and they replace the pictures from the May articles for the June articles. So if you ever looked at Magnolia Magazine, the recipe section is in the same section of the magazine every single month with almost the same layout, just different recipes. It's because they already did the template, the wireframe, all of the boxes. All they did was replace the pictures. Yes, they adjusted the size of the boxes based on if the cheesecake needed to be a little bit bigger in their layout or the brownies needed to be a little bit smaller, but nonetheless, they had a wireframe. Do you know that agencies pay designers sometimes independently just to build wireframes for them? And then they have their in-house people populate the wireframes or they pay a designer to build the template and then they have someone who knows how to use InDesign but isn't a designer to just replace the pictures. You could be a marketing manager and they already gave you the corporate template for the catalog, but you're the local branch and you're replacing the pictures in the template. Well, you know the X, you know the container, you're just selecting the container and replacing the picture. So marketing managers, corporate managers, creative directors, designers, sometimes you just need to know the template. Okay, so now that we have our boxes, we just need to pop some pictures in our boxes. Remember, you could do it any of those ways I showed you, but the end product is a container that has a picture in it. So let's deselect our container for number one. So let's go to page number one and let's click on it so you know that the container's there. So you're not on your master. Make sure that you're not on your master. And then let's just deselect. So we're just going to tap our cursor so there isn't a box around. You can see the blue box, but it isn't selected, right? So let's go file, place. Let's go find that screenshot of that first picture, this one right here. Let's click open. And let's move our mouse and let's let's just tap it over the box. Ooh, well, that's genius, right? But look, it cropped it. Well, that was the size box I wanted, so I can't do that, right? We already drew the container where we wanted the picture. We need to tap on that little center circle and move this thing. And you can move it with your arrow keys. 
right? You see how my hand turns into that little, the arrow turns into a little dashed box around it. I can click the edge of the picture and I can move it, right? See, I can use my arrow keys. I can grab the little circle in the center and click and drag it. So whatever's most comfortable for you to move that picture, but it needs to be the orange box. So if it isn't the orange box, you need to click on your image. There's the blue box. Click on the center circle, which is the creates the orange box. And then you can use your arrow keys. You can click and hold your mouse down and drag inside the box and just crop it so that you can see the dudes the original Baskin and Robbins. Because you will need to manipulate pictures in one of your first four chapters. The boxes will already be there with the pictures in it and you need to move them around and adjust them. Can I make a picture smaller inside of the box and be okay? So if I grab this corner right here and I hold down shift, and I make this picture smaller, is that okay? Can I make pictures smaller in Photoshop and be okay? Yeah. Should I make the picture bigger inside of the container? No, do not ever make pictures bigger in Photoshop, in InDesign, in Illustrator if you placed a picture. Remember, resolution is tied to output. You can't make it bigger. Remember I said it was like licking your thumb and smearing the pixels. Pictures can't be stretched. They can be compressed. They can't be stretched. So if my picture is too big for the container I drew, I can hold down shift and make it smaller. Also remember that shift is important because it scales it proportionately. If I don't hold down shift, I turn a golden retriever into a hot dog dog. Remember, I squish it. See what happens when I stretch the picture? You can see the picture being stretched. Don't do that. Hold down shift, which your books is very clear on. Hold down shift and make the picture smaller. Scale it proportionately. And so I'm just gonna make it a little smaller so it fits inside the box. I'm gonna make it small enough where I can see 31 flavors and the dudes. So 31 flavors and the dudes. So yours should look something like that. Remember to get to the content in the container, you gotta click on the circle that appears inside that blue box, or you can also double click on it. If you double click on the box picture, it will give you the picture in the box. So now I would like you to place pictures in the other three boxes and make sure you can actually see the gist of the photo in the box. So if the box is too small, and the picture's too big, make the picture bigger, but keep the box the same size. So I'm gonna go to file place. I'm gonna click on one of my other pictures like that nice ice cream scoop. And I'm just gonna tap inside that box. So there it is, right? But it's too big. So I need to click on the center circle, grab the corner, hold down shift and make it smaller. Right, so see, and then I can always, where it turns into a hand, I can always pan the picture. Grab the corner, hold down shift, make it smaller, grab the hand, slide the picture. So I want you guys to place three photos and make them kind of centered in your box. So make them smaller and drag them to the middle of your pictures, all three boxes. So I'll go to my next one, file place, click on this little rabbit ice cream cake thing is awesome. Double click, grab the corner, hold down shift. Now, if I hold shift option, I can scale from the middle. So you see how I did shift option? It'll allow me to cheat and kind of scale this thing, keeping it in the center of the box. 
option key scales from the center. So if you hold shift and option, you can actually scale it from the center. So you don't have to grab the corner, scale it, get the hand, drag it back to the middle, grab the corner, scale it, go to the middle, get the hand, drag it to the middle. So let me do that one more time. Yep, shift and option together on the keyboard. So if you do, oh, so what's your middle? Alt, Alt, so shift and Alt. Grab the corner of your picture, hold shift and Alt down and see if it scales from the middle. Yeah, I forgot it's an Alt key. I still call this the Apple key and it's command and control on yours. It used to have an Apple key on the command key here. And I used to call it the Apple key and I still call it the Apple key even though they removed the Apple from it. So yes, option or alt on a PC, shift is the same, command and control is the PC version of the, the command. So if I file place in my last box, I'm gonna grab another picture, maybe the unicorn ice cream cake and I tap it on the blue box, see how it fills in the middle. So if I double click or click on that and I do shift alt from the corner or shift option, it will scale down. Now, when you scale your picture down, make sure it's still inside the, make sure it's still bigger than the box. So we wanna make sure the picture scales down, but we wanna make sure it's still bigger than the box. Why is that important? Because the box is an empty box. You get white edges, you get white edges, yeah. So scale it so it's still a little bit bigger than the box. And you should have all of your pictures placed in your box. And no pictures should be on your master. So if you double click anywhere on your master, there should be no pictures on your master. You should have a big picture on page one, two smaller pictures on two, and a medium sized picture on three. Are we okay? We got one, two, three, four pictures placed. We have a header and a footer. We have a special character page number. We have a color box and a stripe on the master. And we have a total of four pictures in our document. The last part of the puzzle for InDesign is text. Lots of text. That's the key to InDesign. Placing pictures in containers putting text and flowing the text across pages. That's the key to InDesign. For the sake of the process, we're gonna actually flow a bunch of text on page two and three, and then we're gonna go back and make some fancy text on page one, which would be like our cover page. So let's add some filler text. So let's go to page number two. Make sure you're on page number two. And remember there's two columns, right? Two columns, page number two. Let's use our text tool. So let's click on our text tool. And we're gonna take our text tool and we're gonna draw a box that's the full length of column number one. So you see I clicked and dragged and I made a box the full length of column number one. It doesn't matter if you make it too small because we can always change, it's a container, right? All right, so let's go to type, fill with placeholder text because we're just using Latin text, dummy text is what they call it. So let's do that. And you're gonna notice all the words are there. It was like we're a genius. We just wrote 200 lines of text and we <laughs> didn't have to break a sweat. Now, once we draw that box, let's go back to our selection arrow. Right, let's go back to our selection arrow. And I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit so you can see it. Remember, this is a container. So if I change the size of the container, the words are going to change based on the size of the container. The columns are important because that's telling us, you know, how big 
the boxes and spaces are on the container. So let's make it a full size of the entire page number two. So make your box as big as the entire two columns all the way to the margins. So let's make your box that big, right? Now, that text is in front of the picture, right? Well, first off, we wanna send it to the back, right? We need to send it to the back. But take a look at this thing. It's so cool is that if I double tap my cursor, so look at my cursor. I'm gonna double tap it and hit enter. And let's do type fill with placeholder text. Now you should have a whole box of text, right? So we just filled that box. So whatever the size was, imagine a author wrote an article for you and you had a Word document of 25 pages of text and you did select all, right? Edit select all or Command C or Control C. It's Control A, copied it, Control C. And you went into InDesign and drew one big box and did Control V. It would put all of the text from all 25 pages into one box. Now, how would we know that? Let's take this box and just shrink it down to column number one now. Are we okay? Do you see the red plus? Let's click on the red plus. And you see that your cursor now is telling you that there's more text. Let's go right up to the corner of column number two and tap our mouse once, just tap it. So watch what happens if we make column number one, I'm gonna click on column number one and make it a little shorter. So let's drag it up a little bit. Did you see that column number two just got bigger, more words, and there's a little red plus? Watch if we make column number one back to the full column. No plus, white space at the bottom, right? The plus means there's more text than is in the box. Okay, so we got it. It's flowing from column number one, column number two. You see this little plus symbol, this little play? That just means that that is linked to that. Just meaning that this text is going here. We could copy and paste 20 pages of a document and draw one box and click paste and click that little red plus, go to column two, tap it. Take the little red plus at the bottom of column two, go to column number three, tap it. And literally flow the document with all 20 pages across 20 pages in our document. Well, how good is that? Well, the author comes back and says on page number two, paragraph number three, they want that to be a block quote, which means bigger and italic. All pages from page four to 24 will get readjusted because we flowed the text across all 24 pages in InDesign. That is the master, the beauty of InDesign. All the text is connected. Now, last step of the process. This is the end of the lecture. We have to bring the pictures to the front and we wanna make the words go around the picture, which we call text wrapping. First thing we need to do is we need to send the text column behind the pictures on page number two. So where do you think you would go to look for that? Right click. So let's right click. Right click anywhere in the paragraph and do arrange send to back. Ooh, all right. Well, unless you're a mind reader, no pun intended, you can't see the words behind the pictures, right? You can't see the words behind the pictures. So if I use my selection arrow and click on my first ice cream, right? I can move it around, but it's still covering up the words. Are we okay? Okay. Up at the window drop down, make sure you have text wrap selected. And you see this little thing right here? 
let's pick on wrap around bounding box. Ooh, all the words go around the picture. You also notice now there's a red box at the bottom of this saying, hey, dummy, the text now is too much for this. You need to add it over here. But before we do that, let's change the wrap and make there be a bigger invisible box around that picture. So you can actually pick any of these, top, bottom, left, and right, and hit the up arrow because they're locked. And you see the little invisible box that's growing around the picture? This thing right here, that is the text wrap box. So you see how the words are getting closer to the picture? So let's make it 0 0.125. Right, so let's do that to the next picture. Let's click on it. Let's kind of position it over to the right here a little bit. So it's just kind of sitting on the right. Let's click on around the box and let's make it 0.125. Bringing in pictures and sending them to hot behind type so that you can have type on top of it. Yeah, bringing pictures and putting them off to the side and doing individual text boxes around it is a no-go. When you're in InDesign, you need to wrap the text around the pictures so that you can text flow your boxes from one box to the next. That's the beauty about InDesign. If I made a text box just above this picture and a text box just below this picture, if I made them not connected, if I change the size of the picture, Text above, it does not affect the text box below. The beauty of InDesign is that the box is the full size of the column. Does that make sense? So if I select picture here and I go to transform and decide that I want this picture to be bigger, look at what's happening to the text. It's adjusting both columns to the picture. It is wrapping everything. I mean, how great is that? I mean, so let's make that picture go across the first column and part of the second column. Look at the words, they wrap all around the image. It's genius. Designers typically draw the X, pick the number of columns and draw all the X boxes and flow the text into the columns and then place the pictures and wrap the pictures. They can pre-frame everything out and then build the layout after it. It flows everything for you. So I think I wanna take this picture and move it to the lower left-hand corner. And look what it did. It left aligned the text to the right edge of the picture. It's genius. If I take this picture and move it over here, it flows this text to the left, the right edge of this picture as left the line. It's genius. If I move this to the middle, it wraps the text around the picture on both sides. This is the power of InDesign. Menus, magazines, newsletters, textbooks, pictures in, text wrapped, text flowed in columns. That's the simplicity of this program. Yes, you can make words bigger. You can make them bold. You can add extra enters in the paragraph. The key is that the text containers are the size of the columns and the pictures are X pictures, X containers with pictures inside of them. The layouts are endless. You can take a picture, put it behind the words, make the words white in the areas where the picture is. The power is in the wrapping around the picture in the copy. Because guess what? These words right here need to go to page three. So if you click on column number two and you click on the plus symbol and you go to this column. So watch, I'll tap anywhere in the edge of this column it already knows to fill that column. If it doesn't go all the way to the top, I just drag it up to the top. 
If I need it to go down to the bottom, I drag it down to the bottom, but it already puts it in the column. So let's do what we did on page two. Let's select the picture or the text, right click on it. If it's the text, send it to back. If it's the picture, bring it to front and have the picture on top of the text. Cl click on the text wrap and add a rectangular wrap. Make it 0.125. And let's move that picture into the middle of the page. And the reason I did that was because I want another plus symbol. See, there's the plus symbol. I'm going to click on the third column and I'm going to tap on the plus symbol and I'm going to tap the cursor in this column. I don't have another plus symbol. All right, make that picture big enough. So click on the transform tool. Right? So if we click on the picture and we click on transform, we can make that bit thing bigger. Remember, you need the transform in order to scale the box and the picture in the box. If you just use the selection arrow, you're making the box bigger, but not the picture inside of the box. So if I just do the selection arrow and I click on this and I make it bigger, see how the container's bigger, but the picture never changed, which might be fine because that's white space but make it big enough that you get the plus symbol. We need a big enough container to flow so that you can flow to your third page. And so now you have pictures that have text wrapped. They're in front of the text frames and the text frames are flowed across four columns, page two and page three, column one, two, three, and four in essence. If I wanted a color box to go be behind all of these pictures and text on page two and three, but I only want the color box to go behind page two and three, do I draw the color box on the master? If I want a, a light yellow color box to go behind the text on page two and three, behind the pictures on page two and three, I want a box that goes all the way across. It's a part of the spread, right? It's across left and right. Do I draw it on page two and three and send it to back? Or do I draw it in the A master on the left and right? But I only want it on page two and three. So if I add more pages to my document, just on page two and three. If I wanted a stripe to go off every spread in my document, like this line segment we drew, or like the little yellow we put at the bottom of page two, it needs to be on the master. So one last step, just so that you can see the power. Let's use the rectangular shape tool. Rectangular shape tool, this one right here, just like we did on the master. And make sure you're on page two. I want you to draw a big box across the entire document. Big box, right through the middle of the entire document. Rectangular shape tool, page two, draw a big box, right? It's empty, or it might have a stroke on it. I want you to go over here to the swatches tab, and I want you to make it the light yellow we did for the master. And I want you to make the stroke, see, I'm gonna click on the stroke. I want you to make the stroke none. So no border, okay? Now we need to send it to back, right? We need it to send it back. I like to always go back to the selection arrow. So when I'm drawing shapes, whether it's a regular shape, a text shape, a picture shape, 
I always want to go back to the selection arrow. That way I know I can change the size. If I want the strike to be a little bit bigger, I can make it a little thinner if I want, but I can also send it to back. So let's right click on it and do arrange send to back. Did the color fill in the text wrap area, the little space between the photo and the text? Yeah, yes. See this little space right here? It's yellow. The text wrap is only for the photo. It just gives you extra space. The type has a transparent background. So any color, any pictures, any anything we send the back on an individual document will go behind the words. If I wanted to make three sentences on page number two, bold. How would I do that? Three sentences on page number two, anywhere in the document, bold. Highlight them and then put bold. Page two, anywhere in the paragraphs of words we have, I want three sentences to be bold. No. No, you go on the main, you go on the page that weren't matched or you highlight certain sentences and just put bold or italic or yeah. something. Yeah, it's just like Word. So if I wanted to make anything in that text box bold, I would use my text tool. I would highlight it like Word and I would choose bold. Are we okay? That is InDesign in a nutshell. It is a multi-page document program that has a master page attached to it, a place where you put stuff that appears on every page, and it has a text container and a picture container, and that's it. All the shape tools are, are containers with color in them, empty containers with color in them. InDesign is built on two containers, text container and photo container. That's it. A line segment is a really skinny container with color in it. Could a photo container, container with an X, have color in it. Yeah, that container has a fill and a stroke just like any other container. So if I made a picture smaller than the X frame, so I just like you did, put the picture in but made it too small, I could make it a, have a red border. Just, I would add the fill color to the box in red. It's just white because that's the paper color of the document. All there are are two boxes, the X box with pictures and the empty container box with text. That's it. It's as fancy as you want it to be or as simple as you want it to be. A photo can be a background image, can be a foreground image, can have text wrapped around it. Text can be a simple text box on top of a picture. A text box could be a text column with flow text that goes from column to column to column. That's it, that's all InDesign is. A master page and multiple pages in a document that either have text or picture, text and picture. That's it. Your files look a lot fancier, but that is the base bottom thing. If it's on every page, it's in the master. If it's on individual pages, it's on the pages themselves. And if you use your selection arrow and select any of the stuff in your book files, it's gonna give you the properties. And that's it. They look a lot fancier than that, but they're the exact same thing. Pictures and text in a container.
And that's it. All right, gang online, I'm gonna stop the recording and the share and everything so that I can embed the lecture in the announcement section. Remember next week is spring break. So the way Zoom works is it puts all four weeks together. The last Zoom lecture is not Thursday, it's next Thursday. It wouldn't let me change the date because it's tied sequentially four weeks in a row. So if you log on this week, I'm gonna get an email or next week, I'm gonna get an email saying, you know, Betty is in the Zoom, but Chip is not in the Zoom. Only Betty is in the Zoom. Chip will be in the Zoom in two Thursdays. Hopefully you can get your uh, InDesign chapters done over the end of the week or the weekend so that you have a free spring break, but it is a free week to do book work. Monday campus is closed, but I do believe Tuesday through Friday it's open. I will double check that and put it in the announcement section for you guys. I'm gonna post the lecture in there too. So uh, have a good end of the week, have a really good spring break. I'm gonna to try to take as much time as I can too because I have like three classes a month for like the next four months. So um, I'm gonna to try to do a little bit of a break too, but um, have a good week, have a good spring break and I'll see you in two weeks for the last week of the class. I'm just gonna turn that off because I gotta answer a chat real quick. If you're comfortable, we're done.